Welcome back, uh, everyone, after the break. My name is Zoe Rapti, and I'm a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, this session is titled AI to Mitigate COVID-19 and fu Future Pandemics. It's my pleasure to introduce the first speakers, um, Professor Narendra uh, Ahuja and um, Dr. David uh, Beisel. They will talk about remote audiovisual sensing based physiologic assessment in emergency department patients. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, Dr. Yuja and I are going to talk about um, our early attempts at creating audiovisual um, uh, diagnostics, kind of a new, a new class of clinical tools that kind of work at that human machine interface uh, that uh, Gary Kasparov was referencing. So I'm an emergency physician at University of Chicago, and for the last two years, uh, I've been you know, taking care of COVID patients. And it's been, you know, difficult for everybody, you know, in the world. I think one thing, the impacts are many, but what we've seen, at least in the clinical sphere, is uh, at least immediately we saw a decrease in clinical care across all um, uh, specialties. And I think the early stories, we were worried about hospital crowding, but what we soon saw is that many hospitals were going out of business, uh, uh, clinic, clinics were closed, and people were deferring care. And we're going to be paying that price for deferred care for the next decade, probably, because a lot of things happened. You know, a lot of uh, chronic diseases were either not managed at all or mismanaged during that time period. And while the recovery, you know, there, there was kind of an inst almost instantaneous decrease in about, of about 60% in uh, in-person clinical care visits, that, you know, the graph that I'm showing here shows how it recovered rather quickly over a series of a uh, few months. But there's another story, uh, specifically in populations of low socioeconomic status, uh, patients who um, are Hispanic, Latinx populations, uh, African-American populations, children, and also patients with mental illness, where that curve really hasn't recovered, OK? Now, um, there are some bright spots because this COVID epidemic also drove kind of a new type of care, really, which is that is, that is the adoption of virtual care. Now, tel virtual care, otherwise known as telemedicine, has been around for decades, but it really hasn't had widespread adoption. And that's for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, primarily economic, right, as the adoption of almost any technology is driven by the economics of it. Um, but with those economic uh, barriers cleared away uh, by, uh, by Congress um, in the ways we get um, paid, we saw kind of widespread adoption across a variety of specialties in telemedicine. Uh, so primary care, urgent care, specialty care, uh, chronic disease care. Uh, we were using it actually in the emergency department to follow up with our patients. And so it was a fairly uh, dramatic adoption rate. Now, virtual care is wonderful. It might actually close uh, pre-existing gaps in care that we've seen in many of these special populations that I referenced on the last slide, um, because there's always been these large gaps of care for those populations, and also uh, rural populations that don't have easy access to um, in-person care. But there are many diagnostic kind of limitations to virtual care. Um, and to understand these limitations, let me tell you about the 80-20 rule. Now, the 80-20 rule is something we uh, think about in uh, the diagnosis, of, in, the, in the field of diagnosis, where 80% of a diagnosis happens just by the discussion, OK? You tell me who you are. You tell me what's going on today. And 80% of the time, I can, I can just tell you what's going on. Before I leave the room uh, in the emergency department, 80% of the time, I know what's going on. I know how the, the story is going to go. And for the decision theorists out there, you're going to say that I'm probably kind of, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm falsely kind of coming to a, you know, a conclusion too early. But 80% of the time, that's, that's where we land. This 20% is left to kind of the physical exam and other kind of quantitative uh, data that I use in, in the diagnosis space. So this would include physical exam, labs, 
um, and tests, other tests, either radiology tests, like uh, uh, Mary, Mary Ellen Geiger is going to talk to you about shortly, or, um, or analytic tests. So with virtual care, we really lack you know, a lot of this objective data, the quantitative data, the data that feeds the algorithms that we love to use in, uh, in uh, machine learning. It's also very difficult for us to perform physical exams in a virtual setting. Now, when, when I'm talking about virtual care, I'm talking both about kind of you know, maybe a Zoom visit that you might have had with a physician, but also just the telephone visits that we see um, that, that really made up the bulk of virtual care, especially in the early phases of, of the COVID pandemic. And this was especially true in the south side of Chicago, which is a fairly resource poor uh, setting. The other piece with kind of thinking about the long-term uh, uh, trajectory of virtual care adoption is that the reimbursement models really don't support um, having you know, me sitting by a phone or me sitting, me as a physician sitting in front of a monitor all day. Um, and so oftentimes virtual care is staffed by a mid-level provider who might not have the years of training that I do. And so maybe kind of somewhat limited in their ability to diagnose already. And now we're asking them to diagnose without the um, advantage of a physical exam or without the advantage of you know, the simplest thing, the starting point of my diagnosis, which is the vital signs, which are the vital signs. So we had this idea to create this new class of virtual diagnostics. Um, and in kind of our collaboration as, uh, as physicians and computer scientists, we thought, well, let's try to follow kind of as we're developing these diagnostic models, let's try to follow kind of um, accepted models of, in medicine and kind of like what is the, the pathway to a diagnosis? What are the elements that go into a diagnosis? Not really explainable AI per, per se, but at least kind of follow kind of the accepted ingredients, if you will. We also th thought that it would be important to train on actual patients. Much of the work that's been done in this space has been done on graduate students, okay, who are largely healthy, at least when they start their graduate programs. Um, <laughs> we also thought it would be important to use, you know, train on diverse populations, right? So much of the work that's been done kind of in, in, in AI in general, and it's a very hot topic, you know, this, the, the, the bias that has been kind of encoded into, into a lot of the ML, uh, the successful ML algorithms uh, that have been published. And so why not, let's take this opportunity to do it right this time and let's use diverse populations. So actual patients, diverse populations, and let's do it in a clinical environment rather than in the lab under ideal conditions. Let's take it into the noisy, chaotic atmosphere that I work in every day. And now let's try to get some data. We also thought it would be important to utilize consumer grade equipment rather than kind of you know, you know, high definition cameras and, and, and you know, audio devices that were you know, just not going to be part of you know, freely available to consumers. And finally, let's try to do it in a way that will kind of minimize computational complexity so that we can eventually deploy these to edge devices that may or may not be connected um, to the cloud. So uh, here's what we did. We uh, acquired uh, uh, data from close to 100 patients in two urban emergency departments in Chicago. Um, I'm not going to have you go through this demographic table, but this is the traditional table one from a, from a, clinical, uh, uh, a clinical study. And I will just tell you that this was a, a reasonably sick group. Okay? The group was you know, middle-aged. They were largely African American. They, 25% of them had diabetes. Many of them smoked. 63% had hypertension. 15% uh, had uh, heart disease. It's you know it's a very sick group of patients. And so this is unique within kind of this computational space, like this this type of data set. So we took a, a consumer grade uh, DSLR and, and, a, and, a, and a field recorder. And we put it actually in the room. So that's just a picture of a ring light with a, with a field recorder and a, and a camera sitting in an emergency department room. And we went through what we called our virtual exam, which was a standardized exam based a lot on kind of what I was taught as a physician, uh, you know, 
took that traditional exam and tried to virtualize it, what would that look like? And then could we standardize it and, and instruct a patient on how to go through the exam without touching them, right? So, we're, so the uh, research assistant was um, kind of in the room and just instructing them kind of verbally. And if you want to know more about this, there's a poster uh, later this afternoon. But we went through some standard kind of things, and we were looking at these, these factors, which I won't go through because we're kind of short on time. Um, and we also then captured kind of uh, gold standard uh, data through our clinical monitors. So this, this would be the vital signs uh, through the clinical monitor. And then we finally kind of did the kind of uh, the, the uh, John Henry kind of test. And we went back to the physician and we said, OK, what is your gestalt? Tell me about what you think about this patient. How likely is it that this patient is going to decompensate in the next, um, you know, in, in, in the next 24 hours? What diagnosis do you think this patient has? OK, so we got some clinical gestalt captured just through surveys. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Yushman. So I'm just going to go over some of the algorithms that we have developed for uh, a selected set of uh, vitals and a little bit on disease prediction. Um, and finish with some collaboration that we are starting with another group. OK, so uh, in the motivated by the fact that we have to work with smartphones so that a patient can have the smartphone sitting next to them and the doctor is sitting in the emergency room and they can have this uh, trust that they can watch them. So the algorithm has to not only continuously build the profile, health profile, but also predict if there is a decompensation imminent. Predict that the patient is going to fall sick, in which case they can make arrangements to get them to the emergency room. So that was the original proposal that we want to have bed sparing protocol so that people can be sent home without the worry that they will fall sick and there'll be nobody to take care of them. So, <clears throat> so four things that I'm going to talk about is three uh, vitals estimation um, algorithms, uh, heart rate and uh, from visual data and respiration rate from both audio data and visual data, and then detection of COVID. Okay. And like I said, we are keeping these algorithms too with minimal complexity, at least in the beginning, so that we don't compromise speed and uh, being hosted on the smartphone. Later on, if we can afford, we'll make them more and more uh, sophisticated as needed. So the heart rate estimation is simply based upon the way the skin responds, the skin color responds to the flow of blood. Since the flow of blood is periodic because of the heart pumping, so what you expect is that this, uh, uh, the light coming in and getting reflected from the top layer or from the inner layers would have whatever it is, whatever the equation is which governs this as a function of this, doesn't matter, but it's periodic. So you detect periodicity, that's all. So um, that's the RPPG, which a lot of people have been using uh, in this case. <clears throat> um, so that's what we do for heart rate. However, we want to make sure that the patient who is sitting there, this is one of our, one of the frames from our, from our data set. Um, what we do is we want to be able to estimate the heart rate, whether the patient is, despite wanting to cooperate, is moving their head or not moving their head, what's the angle of the camera, maybe they didn't follow the right guidelines. So we want to be able to make robust estimates, and the robust estimates in this case are that you see what is happening period, periodicity-wise, here, here, and here. And these points are defined with respect to the 3D of the face. So what we, get, what we do is we get three-dimensional map of the face, and then we find out whether forehead is um, move, uh, the moving or not, face is moving or not. If it's not moving, then the best thing to do is to get the data from here, from the face. So from the forehead. If the face is moving, then you get it from one of the cheeks. But which cheek depends upon which is more frontal. So from doing the 3D estimation, you know which is the frontal version if it's moving. So from that, then it, it is uh, simple. You just extract the signal from the region of interest, which is either the forehead or the cheek, and get the signal. Um, 
and then just from that signal do periodicity, which is, which is nothing, nothing very special. We just do the frequency analysis and get the estimate with some appropriate steps. And these are the, these are the results when the head is still and when the head is in motion. That's the ground truth over there, uh, number one. And number two is the range of estimates. The rate, the error is about two beats, 2.28 beats per minute, which according to our collaborator, you know, Dr. Beiser and the rest of the team from Chicago is within acceptability. So this is all I'm going to say about heart rate estimation. Then um, let me get to the respiratory rate estimation from audio. We'll do a video also. So what you do is you take the breathing signal, audio signal, you, uh, you, you find the boundaries of the, between successive breaths, you locate them, represent each segment by its spectrogram, and, the, and, and know what are the most, no, observe what are the most periodic set of frequency bands that characterize the moment. And then after that, to get that from that sequence of intervals, which are not necessarily deterministic. They are, you know, stochastic because not each breath follows the same period. So you take the feed, you put that into the LSTM network instead of what we used to use earlier, then and get the best estimate of the period. And uh, when it, this is training, and for inference, you simply find the probability that a boundary exists between successive breaths at specific times. So you get, a, you get. A <coughs> Uh, those locations of breath changes, or the boundary, you know, from exhale to inhale, inhale to exhale, etc., and then you estimate the breathing rate from there. So this is um, this is the spectrogram. Uh, there are some frequencies which are most dominant energy-wise, which is co which correspond to the uh, uh, breathing, and uh, and then you mark you mark as ground truth the red locations, which are the which are the ground truth of uh, inhale ending, exhale beginning, and vice versa. Um, and uh, we want this as the output. And this was the original, would have been red line here if we had the ground truth. But these are the probabilities that breath is there. And from this set of probabilities, we come up with the best possible, uh, the, uh, somehow the um, mean breath uh, interval length of it. Okay, so the results are, um, we considered uh, three cases, clean, more noise, added noise, more noise, and the, uh, the estimate was about one cycle off from the real value, and the standard deviation was 1.7 for the clean case, and then they get, got a little worse as we went. And those are all within the realm of acceptability. Um, Respiration rate estimation from video, very simple. You, you just, you don't worry about the sound, you worry about the chest moving. And, and the, again, it's periodic. So you don't worry about the absolute nature of the signal. All you're looking for is periodicity, which really takes away a lot of responsibility from analysis. And so um, you find the region of interest, which is the chest area. Look at the movement, detect periodicity. Now there are other methods where <clears throat> People look at skin for, for also for, you know, for not, not just heart rate, but also for breathing. And in our case, we didn't use that because then you bring in the dependence on the light. And in this case, periodicity is much better reflected in the motion. And also, uh, if you use pure velocity, then that is dependent on the, post the perspective from which you are looking. Uh, people have used uh, fixed directions of motion or viewing and done it from there. So what we do is we simply um, do the very straightforward, trivial thing. We just look at the chest area, okay, and uh, try different shifts and just find the best autocorrelation. You know, it's these STAT 101. So we, we just find the best correlation for which shift it is the best that tells you what the period is. We are working on, so this is the result, uh, the estimate of the uh, breaths per minute um, is best here, and the ground truth is green. So the estimate is about <coughs> about two beats per minute uh, mean absolute error. 
finally, um, COVID detection from audio. We considered uh, three types of audio inputs, speech, breath, and cough. And the idea is that the patient, when they're at home, away from the emergency department or hospital, they would just read a certain script, breaths they are taking anyway, and they will be asked to cough. So, so that those three signals will uh, be, be processed this way for each, each individual input. You represent them by spectrogram, you find their features as autoregressive prediction coefficients, and then train using those features. Um, but uh, you can do it individually, but you can also do it jointly. Hopefully jointly would be better. So here are the three individual feature-based training. The results come here from each of them. And then if you just uh, take them together and uh, fuse them, and then the estimate hopefully will be more robust. So here are the results. Um, for speech, breathing, and cough individually, and, uh, and the joint one. Um, the baseline we used here is the DICOVA baseline. That is a challenge that was run in 2021, the second one. The first one was starting in 20, I think, but mostly they were in 2021. There were about 30 teams. And um, uh, this is for acoustic analysis of COVID kind of abbreviation. Uh, and uh, those are our results for individual and joint. Um, and we were placed second in the second challenge. First challenge, we were third. But in the second, we were second. Um, <clears throat> and um, before I finish, uh, this is our team. Um, Dr. Chestek and Mark Hasegawa Johnson are not here. Uh, John is here. And, and Mustafa is here. But before I finish, I want to make one more comment that we are working with a team in India. And that team has developed an app which has been adopted by Apollo hospital chains. About 200,000 people have already used it to assess it. It has ISO 1345 clearance for medical devices. But the important thing for us is that we have diverse data from Chicago. We have standard data sets that are published, which are mainly Caucasian. And now we have a huge population from India. So if you combine them, we have quite diverse data set. And if we can have an algorithm work on all of them, it will be forced to be independent of some of the factors that distinguish them. And uh, uh, we are going to see if we can merge the two somehow uh, and come up with a, a universal, closer to universal app. Thank you.